as Reverend Bridget uh, said, I'm going to be talking about the stories we tell ourselves. So uh, let me jump in. Uh, three years ago, I moved from Asheville, North Carolina to Santa Cruz, California. And that was a decision that was complicated by the fact that my twin brother lives there and has for 40 years. And moving to his town would require that we not only run afoul of our long standing policy that there ain't no town big enough for the two of us, um, meaning that we need our own turf. Um, but I figured would certainly trouble the ghost of our mother who instilled that taboo in us with her insistence from the day we were born that we were going to have separate identities. So there was no um, Ron and Don stuff, <laughs> okay? Um, we had separate bedrooms, separate classrooms in school. We had to take up different instruments. Uh, different hobbies, uh, go to different summer camps, even different bus stops, okay? So when I told my brother Ross of my interest in considering Santa Cruz as a place to relocate and shared with him my concern about moving to his town, uh, he initially shrugged it off. He said, uh, you know, 15 years ago, I probably would have agreed, but I'm over it. So uh, one day during a month long experiment in dating Santa Cruz, in other words, living there for a month to see if it was actually a fit, I went into the grocery store that's around the corner from his house, the one that he frequents. And when the cashier asked if I wanted a receipt, and I said, yes. She said, really? You never want a receipt. So I got to say something to her that I say a lot since I moved to Santa Cruz. Um, I'm not who you think I am. And I love the look on people's faces when I say that. And this happens about once a week and has for several years because he knows everybody. I said, I I I'm not who you think I am. I'm his twin brother and I'm not pulling your leg. And I'm the twin who always wants a receipt. <laughs> so later that same day, Ross went into the same grocery store, just independent of me, stood in the same checkout line. And the same cashier said to him, I saw your other half today. Not realizing what a loaded remark that is for a twin. <laughs> that night, my brother told me he had the first of a number of nightmares about the prospect of me moving to his town, uh, including uh, in uh, one dream, uh, avalanche, in another dream, a mudslide, in a third dream, a Tyrannosaurus Rex tearing up the town of Santa Cruz. So uh, turns out he was not over it, uh, nor was I really. Um, and this is not surprising. All right. It's not surprising because the prohibition against living in the same town was among the longest standing stories of our life together. And we we were not going to just edit it out uh, without some backlash. But it was only the only way we were able to grow beyond that story um, and even consider living in the same town was to confront that story and to hash it out together and separately, all right? So the fact is, we all have stories that we tell ourselves about who we are, about how it is, about what we're capable of, what can and can't be done, why we succeed or fail, what we can expect from life. And I think we do that because we are storytelling animals and we, tell stories, we create stories, really to help us figure things out, to help us make sense of life, to give us a framework for making decisions, really, 
all right? But those stories can sometimes turn against us, especially the negative stories or the constricting stories like, um, I'm not the creative type or I'm powerless to change the world or I'm a, a victim or people are untrustworthy or vulnerability is weakness or a thousand others, of course, All right? And I think they become self-limiting when they come up against what I think of as life's primary agenda, which is to grow, all right? And they can undermine our belief, like we have here in the New Thought world, that we are each an expression of God, and therefore sacred and worthy. They can, some of these stories can undermine that belief, that understanding, all right? Um, and especially if the stories we're telling ourselves become lies of identity, like I am what I do, right? Or I am what I have, or I am what other people think of me, all right? And, and these are not just um, big stories like lies of identity. I think um, any time you catch yourself having a strong reaction to something or someone, um, knee-jerk anger, for, for instance, unexpected defensiveness, um, irrational fear, I think you're probably dealing with a story that's become so internalized and unconscious that you don't even really hear it anymore. You know, somebody makes a casual remark. And it unconsciously reminds you of something your father used to say to you. And you're just off to the races. All right. You're really not even seeing things as they are anymore, but as they were. And probably stuck inside of a story that's just going to keep repeating itself unless you confront it and perhaps rewrite it. Okay. So this is not to say, by the way, that there are not some, quote, negative stories that are really important to tell, okay? One example I can think of is um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that were set up in South Africa after apartheid, okay? And how critical they were to the healing and the justice that took place there when the victims of apartheid got a chance to very publicly tell their stories of victimization at the hands of that regime, okay? So I just want to um, offer a generous bow to the fact that there are some negative stories that are really important to tell, uh, at the very least to yourself, okay? So, um, nor am I just talking about old stories, all right? Because I think we are constantly making up stories about what we think is going on around us, you know, what, um, what someone is thinking or what a friend meant by a remark, or what a symptom means, or what a failure says about us, right? Anytime you tell yourself you should do something, I think you're dealing with a story, all right? Anytime you hear a thou shalt not, you know, in the back of your head, probably a story. And certainly, anytime you refer to the story of my life, which I think is usually something we um, utter in exasperation, right? Uh, this is kind of a statement of pessimism, like, Ugh, that's the story of my life, right? This kind of thing. Um, and of course, the stories we tell ourselves are not just personal, don't just belong to us. Um, they're also cultural, multi-generational, historical, you know? Um, big boys don't, or nice girls don't. These are gender stories that can really haunt your individual life, all right? As are cultural narratives like um, go to school, graduate, get married, have kids, retire, right? So this is um, might give some people a kind of a, uh, a template to use in crafting a life, but it might also punish those who deviate from it, right? Or, set up unrealistic expectations around pursuit of the American dream, okay? Stories are also handed down to us from our spiritual traditions, right? Or maybe more to the point, the um, 
religious education that many of us got, okay? I'm thinking, for instance, of the commandments listed in the first five books of the Old Testament, collectively referred to as the law, right? There are 613 of them. And they're passed down to us as a kind of stories, right? Like, do not marry outside your religion, right? Or make no artistic representations of God. So what that means is that the, the painting that Michelangelo painted on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, you know, this one, blasphemy, according to that storyline, right? Um, another one is follow not the whims of your own heart, which would pretty much put me out of business, um, having written a book called Callings, you know. Um, no tattoos, no blowing on dice, no working on the Sabbath, um, no rebelling against your parents. And he was one of my favorites. Um, no trying God's patience, okay? Um, how about a show of hands? How many of you have ever tried God's patience? So whether the stories we tell ourselves are personal or, you know, transpersonal, I think a story is a box. And when you identify with that story to the point of being stuck or spellbound, right, um, you are inside the box, okay? But when you stop identifying with a particular story, or even just start to question it, you're outside the box, all right? Not that it's easy to think outside the box, no less step outside of it. Stories are powerful, right? I really want to honor stories are powerful. They shape our lives because stories become beliefs, become behaviors. Or as we say in the new thought world, um, thoughts become experience. Okay, they're powerful. Um, and in other words, we don't just tell stories, they tell us. They tell us who we think we are and what we're capable of. And I think that every telling kind of rubs it in a little bit more deeply, whether the stories you tell yourself are um, negative or positive, as in, say, you know, affirmations, right? And the negative stories, though, are a kind of a narrowing down. They're a, they're a constriction of soul and spirit and authenticity and I think power and voice and the knowing that we are sacred and worthy. They're, they're, a, um, they're too small for us. They're really too small for us. Now expanding that, the stories and thus I think our lives starts with catching them in the act, really catching them in the act. I'm thinking of a guy named Dan McAdams and he belongs to a branch of psychology called narrative therapy, which is specifically designed to help people change their storylines. He says, and this is the way he languages it, he says, you should interrogate yourself about the stories you tell and quit letting them have their way with you, right? And so one way to do that is, you know, like our parents sometimes would say to us, watch your language. Uh, in other words, Listen to what you say to yourself. Listen to how you talk to yourself. Um, what tone of voice you use. Uh, and for that matter, how you would feel if somebody else were telling you the kind of things you're telling yourself. How would you feel if somebody else said, you know, you're not really the creative type. Um, that would feel kind of different than just hearing it um, as a constant tape loop in your own head and you're probably used to it, right? Um, the process of tuning into this is helped along, needless to say, immeasurably if you have like mindfulness meditation practices um, or uh, journaling practices, dream interpretation practices, right? Uh, for that matter, therapy, right? I had a therapist say to me once after I had shared with him one of my favorite sob stories about how my family of origin had victimized me. He said, so how many times have you told that story? 
How many more times are you planning on telling it? Okay. And because we are always making up new stories, I think it really pays to watch how you craft them, how you get them going. Right. Uh, McAdams says that those, for instance, who tell stories about challenging events in their life, but with a redemptive twist to the story. In other words, something you learned from that challenging experience, uh, some wisdom or insight you were able to wrest from it, um, some way you grew as a result of it. You will tend to thrive more over the course of time than people who tell negative stories about challenging events. For instance, um, when I lost my job at a newspaper early in my career, I initially called it a, a failure. And that was the story I told about it for quite a while after that. But over time, I realized that it was by getting fired from that job that I gained precisely the motivation I needed to finally quit my job and follow the call to become a freelance writer, which I had had for a half a decade at that point. All right. So by focusing on the redemptive twist in that story, I was able to turn it from a, a story of failure to, if not quite a story of success, at least a story of falling up. You get intuitively what I, I mean by that, falling up. Okay, I think the mythologist Joseph Campbell used to call it a directive crisis. Okay, so we're not just the protagonists of our stories, we're the narrators, all right? We're the narrators, we're in charge of the stories, which I think is one reason why it is imperative to separate fact from fiction, which is something we'll do in the workshop a little later this morning, all right? Separate fact from fiction, for instance. My parents divorced when I was nine might be a fact. In my case, it was actually, but it's my fault is a fiction, all right? My father was critical and emotionally absent might be a true story. Again, it was, but I'm unworthy of love is a false story, okay? Um, there ain't no town big enough for the two of us might once have been true, but no longer is. Okay, so you might ask yourself, and again, we'll do this um, in, the, in the workshop, whether a particular story you're telling yourself is true, and how true. How true, because even a shred of contrary evidence, you know, a minor exception to the storyline, uh, um, a small crack in its logic, you know, uh, for that matter, another way it could be told from another point of view might give you that all important shadow of a doubt that can help you question the truthfulness of the story and maybe unhook you from some of the limitations you've put on yourself by repeating the story over and over over the years, right? Um, Example, I've made a regrettable number of life decisions that started and ended with the phrase, I can't afford it. I can't afford it, which grinds into my subconscious a message of self-imposed limitation. It's really a kind of a wrap on the knuckles of the cookie jar. All right. What's actually more accurate is I won't afford it. So this adds into the equation, the critical elements of choice and power, okay? I would prefer to spend my money on car repairs rather than a new computer, okay? So you see the difference, right? Let's say you have a story, as apparently a lot of people do, that you're not the creative type. But under scrutiny, you begin to notice little exceptions to that. You go out into the garden, cut flowers, arrange them in a vase with, you know, the purples in the back and the yellows in the front and the blues in the middle. You're being artistic. You uh, doodle while you're talking to your dad on the phone. You're drawing. You sing along to the car radio. Um, you're singing. You know, you drum your fingers on the desk um, during a meeting at work. 
you're drumming, you're, you're doing percussion, right? Um, you write a letter to a friend, you're writing. When you dream at night, your subconscious is essentially playwriting, okay? And then maybe you realize, I am the creative type. And maybe I need to change the storyline that I'm not, okay? So under scrutiny, and again, something we'll look at in the workshop. But I want to honor that changing stories is not easy, okay? And you're, you know, you're not going to undo stories. You may have been telling yourself for the better part of a lifetime at the flip of a switch, okay? And without some pushback, you know, um, I think it's fair to say changing storylines is going to ruffle feathers, yours, um, but also perhaps other people's, okay? Um, for example, um, a couple of years ago, I'm hiking with my brother Ross in the mountains here, the Santa Cruz Mountains, and we're having a debate about how susceptible we are to cultural conditioning, okay? Started because he made some bold statement about being immune to advertising. And um, to make a point about how susceptible I thought we actually were to advertising and not just the consumer kind, but the cultural kind, I dared my brother to hold hands with me until we reached a uh, bend in the path of 100 yards up perhaps. And he reaches out his hand, accompanied by a look that roughly translated to, I call your bluff. So here's the thing. There was clearly nobody around. There was nobody around. But the next 10 seconds provoked an outbreak of reflexes that would have put Pavlov's dogs to shame. Um, awkwardness, um, embarrassment, self-consciousness, uh, paranoia your conditioning based on a story specifically about how straight men are supposed to act in this culture it's not the same in all cultures but in this culture how straight men are supposed to act okay um all we were doing was holding hands really barely pushing a toe across the line as these things go and all the alarm bells went off okay even though we look almost exactly alike i mean really how suspicious could this be and uh, besides, we're doing this in Santa Cruz, California. Who cares, right? Um, but, and I wouldn't be a proper, a proper twin either if I didn't report to you that um, he broke first. Anyway, being a twin. So changing the stories, though, um, is hard work. Changing the stories we tell ourselves is hard work. And compassion and patience are in order and a sense of humor would come in handy. Um, you may have to sing yourself a different tune a hundred times before it begins to sink in and really hold sway, before you even begin to believe the new storyline. Um, but the truth is that until we begin to notice the stories we tell ourselves and confront, if not um, deconstruct, the core beliefs that are at the heart of those stories, the behavior that grows out of them won't change, okay? So um, it was only by dialoguing with my brother and with myself that we were able to, um, about this story, that there is no town big enough for the two of us, that we were able to amend that story and grow beyond it, okay? And I have to say in closing that we now live happily in the same town for the first time since we were boys. And it is truly one of the great new joys of my life. One of the great growth spurts in my life. So in closing, I just wanna say that in the spirit of upgrading the stories you tell yourself, uh, the workshop um, a little bit later this morning is, or this afternoon I should say, is um, a very hands-on opportunity to gently um, explore the stories, some of the stories you tell yourself, all right? Uh, especially the ones that may be holding you back from what whatever wants to emerge in your life and from the knowledge that you are sacred, in fact, and um, worthy. So I hope you'll come and uh, thank you so much for inviting me back. Thank you, Reverend Bridget and Roger.
um, for having faith in my work and inviting me back. And I look forward to the workshop a little bit later. Thank you.